Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zarrell. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. And joining us this week is former co-host, Josh Adams. Welcome to the show, Josh. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me on this delightful Sunday morning for us. <laughs> well, thank you for coming back. Uh, visit us at I Hate Critics. Not everyone's critic podcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is Critics Pod. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Alexa, Stitcher, all your podcatchers. We're also live on YouTube Sunday mornings or Monday nights. Uh, it's always a last minute decision. So uh, if you click on the little bell in the one of the corners and never remember to look left or right, uh, it allows you to get notified when we are live and when a new episode drops on YouTube. We also have patreon.com slash critics pod. The best way to help support the podcast. Get yourself a credit on the show. And Check out the uh, top 24, 824 Patreon exclusive episode currently. Yes, we have a bunch of Patreon bonuses out there, including that A24 one. We're going to do a top 10 documentary one here very soon. We are we have the I Spit on Your Grave episode, which did drop to the regular audience. But uh, if nothing else, you'll get them earlier. Well, there's definitely two out there that you, the regular audience has not heard yet. The Thanksgiving episode and the A24 episode. So uh, if you want to get earlier bonus content... Head over to patreon.com slash critics pod. And if you want our merchandise, go to T Public and search Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast or Critics Pod. Just get yourself this Cameron Diaz shirt uh, about her shoulder. Uh, we got the Willem Dafoe's uh, sausage shirt. We have the Batman vs. Jesus, <laughs> a regular logo, uh, Lord of the Fitbit. Uh, uh, you get pillows, mugs, shirts, whatever you want, masks. handbags, masks. Uh, it's all there at T Public, or go to IHateCritics.net and click on the T Public link. All right, let's get to the show. And as we do, we have nerdy guests on. Is that the right right phrase? Uh, we, we talk about. Please, by all means, do. Don't forget <coughs> sexy guests. Yes. We talk about nerdy TV shows. We did this a couple weeks ago when Zach was on. <laughs> uh, we're not talking about Woody Allen in that documentary. We're going to talk about Winter Soldier and the Falcon. <laughs> The Falcon, it's the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I don't give a shit. You guys go ahead. I'm going to take a break. <laughs> uh, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is the latest of uh, Disney Plus's television series uh, takes on the Marvel Universe. And uh, this one is about uh, Sam Wilson and uh, <clears throat> Bucky Barnes, the uh, characters played by uh, Anthony Mackie and Sebastian Stan in the uh, Marvel Universe. And uh, they are uh, supposedly going to be teaming up eventually uh not in this first episode which takes for ever to get going and uh really doesn't uh, really didn't do much for me josh i thought this first episode i know they got a lot of world building to do but this was riddled with tv cliches like the writing on this was absolutely brutal the the psychiat <clears throat> we got the psychiatrist scene uh, bucky's seeing a psychiatrist and of course he's too much of a manly man 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 to actually engage with psychiatry because you know real men don't share their feelings and not and whatnot uh anthony mackie uh gets stuck with this really uh, i mean the you know, you know Falcon, right, Bob? You know the character Falcon. He's really he's kind of a cool character. He's got that really cool flying thing that he does. What's the first scene we get with this really cool character played by Anthony Mackie? He's ironing. We get to watch the Falcon iron a shirt. That's our first image on this brand new show. I mean, I just couldn't believe what I was watching. And then it just gets worse from there. And, and it's really a bummer. They get this big action scene that immediately follows that where the Falcon gets the chance to, you know, get into action. And we have no idea, no remote notion what his mission is. He's like flying around trying to save. Is he trying to stop a, a, a terrorist from stealing a plane? Is he trying to save the plane? Is he trying to save the pilot? We have no idea. It's not a terrible action scene, but it has absolutely zero explanation as to what is happening at all. <laughs> it's a really and that just kind of sinks the whole thing and then his whole he's got a whole family drama that he's got going on with his sister that don't care i, I don't i don't care uh do, do something cool do something fun do something exciting this is not this is not interesting and uh it's really unfortunate that there was a, some high hopes for this and then they've got the ptsd thing they've got the uh it was all a dream bit that they do 
Uh, which totally undercut the best action scene in the entire show, uh, which is great. Is what he wrong, think, Josh? Yeah. Is he wrong? <laughs> yeah, uh, this one was pretty darn boring. Uh, we've got 10 episodes now of Disney Plus Marvel episodes, and it is definitely the worst that I've seen so far, but mainly because it just doesn't really do anything. We kind of already knew this about the Winter Soldier, that he had issues, but instead of making it engaging it's just very typical and kind of sets the character back to be honest uh, we thought that he was maybe moving along a little bit based on what we had previously seen but he's in the midst of making amends as he said and uh while that is an interesting part of it the him refusing to acknowledge his nightmares and problems in a psychiatry session is also very typical and just sets the character back. Uh, I don't quite get it. And that, that mission that you're talking about with Falcon, uh, Sean, what the interesting part of that is, uh, he has a battle with a character who was in the beginning of the Winter Soldier movie. Um, that's the character Batrock, played by UFC guy George St. Pierre. Uh, and so he's made a reappearance seven years after we first saw him. And that's nice and everything like that. But nobody knows that his character's named Batrock because they <laughs> never say it. Number two, if you can remember as a casual fan that that guy showed up in Winter Soldier, congratulations to you. you can, you're not a regular fan. You're better than that. <laughs> but the significance of that is completely lost on us because no one references it at all nope. or we don't know who these people are. It's like the beginning of the Dark Knight Rises, where there's a, a kind of a heist on a plane situation going on, but without anyone knowing who the other person is. So uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel like uh, of all types of setup episodes, 50 minutes to set up characters that we're already very well familiar with is, is belaboring the point. Um, mm -hmm. So, just as a one-off, fine. I'm not sitting here uh, writing off the whole series by any <laughs> means yet. But we didn't really see uh, the character that I'm most interested in in Baron Zemo, played by Daniel Bruhl. He may or may not have been behind a mask um, at some point during the show, but we don't know. Uh, we've got this new group of nebulous villains called LAF. Um, when they said that, all I could think of was laugh. And uh, it wasn't amusing to me at all. <laughs> uh, then there's another group called the Flag Stealers or the Flag Smashers or something Flag like smashers, that. Yeah. yeah, and they're interested in having things go back to the way it was before the snap. Well, that, I mean, that sounds pretty, um, pretty awful. Uh, <laughs> so what they want to do basically is kill billions of people. So that sounds like a pretty good big deal and i'm glad that we'll get to deal with these people but it sure seemed to me like a proud boys rally so i don't know how i'm gonna enjoy Ooh, that yeah you guys done yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you for dealing with it bob all this time <laughs> oh i have my headphones off <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right let's get on to the regular part of the show uh, and we'll start with the is this a theatrical release, The Courier? Yes, The Courier, starring uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, is the true life story of a uh, of a man who was just an average British guy, just a just a salesman who uh, gets drawn into a international espionage and gets dropped right into the middle of one of the most important moments in world history. Uh, he's just this guy who's just a pretty normal salesman. He's kind of a kind of a drunk a little bit, uh, just kind of a, a glad hander. And uh, turns out one of the guys that he's uh, been glad handing is a, a member of MI6 who thinks that this would be the perfect guy to send to Russia to check in on a potentially a, a, a member of the Russian government who might be willing to defect or at very least to flip and become a uh, spy for America uh, for, for the, for the West. Uh, it turns out that guy does want to be a spy. He does want to, to uh, get involved because he's trying to stop Russia from uh, launching nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, the, it turns out that this ends up right in the middle of the, uh, of the Cuban missile crisis. And this is <laughs> this one British salesman is in the middle of all of this and ends up, uh, well, making history by, by uh, 
ending up in a Russian prison for over a year. It's a really good movie. Benedict Cumberbatch is pretty fantastic. And this true stories that we continue to get out of the you know World War II and, and the Cold War. We're going to do another one next week where there's these really fascinating stories that have not yet been told. And they're all these based on a true story stories. And this is this is taken from real life. Much of this uh, really did happen. And they do a really good job of uh, underlying the truth of, of what takes place here. This guy really did spend a, a year in a Russian prison and most people didn't know he was doing it. <laughs> That's pretty amazing that uh, that that happened. Is this an error in terms of a release? Because I mean, it sounds like a great movie, and maybe it could have been. I mean, obviously, with what else came out this week, maybe it wouldn't have been a great week to drop it streaming. But or do you think this will just get a second life when it finally hits Netflix or Amazon later on? I'm hoping it'll have a second life. It deserves it. This, like I said, this is a really good movie. I think. Uh, I think maybe people are overestimating the the star power of Benedict Cumberbatch a little bit, but uh, uh, you know, it, it, then hopefully it'll have a second life and, and more of an opportunity to be seen on streaming. Well, the only reason I it's hard to consider anything successful or a failure at theatrical right now because no yeah. one can go to the theater. But I mean, you had that Vince Vaughn movie from last November that still nobody's seen that looks like it'd be fun <laughs> as hell. Yeah, uh, you got nobody coming out next week. Uh, the uh, Bob Odenkirk movie, which I don't think we're going to be talking about. Uh, movies that probably could have been pretty big on Amazon or Netflix right now. Yeah. But it's kind of a shame. Uh, how's Rachel Brosnahan? It seems like she's starting to get more and more roles and become a bigger star after Mrs. Maisel. She's way too big a star for this. Like really? yeah, the role. Yeah, she is. So she, the, the role is just a little bit too too small for her. Um, the, the role is important and she does a good job with it. She's not at all bad. It's just the role just is too is is too small for her. Jesse Buckley uh, gets the role of uh, of Cumberbatch's wife and she gets a lot more to do and is, has a lot more you know wide range to play. Brosnahan is there because you have to have the American aspect of it, you know, because America's in the, essentially the ones right in the middle of the of the uh, Cold War stuff, and especially with the Cuban Missile Crisis. But again, the role is just too small. When her, her start, she kind of stands out, and you kind of want to see more of her than what you get. Gotcha. All right, anything else on the Courier before we move on? See it when you get a chance. All right, and Sean got to go down to Austin to go to South by Southwest from his bedroom. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of movies he watched to start with The Spine of the Night. The Spine of Night. Uh, Bob, you're going to want to see this. Trust me. This is a uh, an adult-oriented animated movie, and I don't mean that to say that there's any type of pornography, although there's a great deal of animated nudity, but uh, this, is, this is a throwback to the... Uh, the movies like Heavy Metal, the uh, the Ralph Bakshi era of uh, of animated adult uh, uh, movies, and this is uh, the story. Basically, this big epic like heavy metal adventure. Like, there's like if you like like Iron Maiden album covers, like that's what this movie is based upon. Like, there's a really a lot of cool images like that. It's super violent. The uh, so the story goes that like Lucy Lawless plays this queen of a forest. And this uh, group of people, this uh, conquering group comes in led by Patton Oswalt and Joe Manganiello, and they burn down the forest and they kill all of her people and they kill her, but then she gets resurrected and she comes back and she starts just murdering people. And there's just people murdering people with giant axes. And it's really amazing. I, I really enjoy this a lot. Uh, and it's really goofy as hell, but it, you know, it's the kind of, just, it's got this really great heavy metal score to it, and it's just really, it's, it's fun. It's so much fun, and just it takes itself really seriously too. Like it's treating this as a big epic adventure, uh, but, and and one which you, if you did this in live action, it would be not nearly as as much fun. You'd definitely make fun of it like you would like, uh, oh god, what was that? Uh, Gods of War? No, I can't even remember what it's called. One of those adaptations of one of those online games. Like they did that in, in live action, it was just stupid looking. If they did Spine of Night in in live action, it would look dumb. <laughs> but in, in animation, it's really awesome. 
That's cool. That's what I was going to ask is how is the score? Because that seems to, that's what really makes it and breaks it for these kind of movies for me, why heavy metal works. I mean, even Mandy, which I think you compared it to as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's really the score is what makes it awesome, at least. So I'm excited to see this one. Uh, so that's really cool. Uh, what else did you see? I'm fine. Thanks for asking. Yeah, this is a director, Kelly Kelly or co-director Kelly Kelly, along with uh, uh, just mostly her. It's her story is that she's a, a, a mom of a young daughter who's about eight years old, and she doesn't want to tell her daughter that they've been kicked out of their house. Uh, She's told her that they're camping um, just for a couple of days until their new house is ready. But reality is, is that they don't have a home. Um, She's saving up money, trying to trying to pay for a new apartment. uh, And uh, to do that, she's uh, cutting hair in people's front yards and she's delivering Postmates and she's doing it all on roller skates on the hottest day of the year in in her suburb of California. And this is a story about the lowest end of the economic ladder. And this is a story about somebody who wants to work and would like to be able to continue to earn a living. She's just lost her husband, unfortunately, and that's what's left her houseless. And this is the kind of story I don't think gets told very often about about our society and about the the lack of a real social safety net. As much as we say that there is a social safety net, I don't think there is, not nearly enough of one. And this is a story of somebody who could, if they just got one little break, you know, they would be okay. They could get in their apartment and they could keep working and, and do well. But this just, everything just keeps going against her. She loses her husband. She, you know, ha- has people who are, are supposed to pay for what she does. You know, they, they're supposed to pay her for her work and they don't. Uh, you know, she's working Postmates, but she doesn't have a car. So she's ro- on roller skates. And that means that it takes her a little bit longer to make her deliveries and then, when she's a little bit late doing her delivery, she gets a, she gets dinged on the stars and the and the tip, and that just keeps happening over and over again. Uh, and just it's it's almost as if this lower end of the economy is expo- is conspiring against her. And this is a really kind of a compassionate story. It's a movie that engenders compassion and care in people, and it, and it really, I the way I thought of it was like there's a lot of people who have this version of capitalism that is just bloodless and lifeless and like uh, you're on your own and I'm on my own and uh, and I just can't live like that. My version of capitalism would have have some way to help her. That's just my version of it. I think there's a, there's a way to do capitalism that isn't just that isn't just, you know, you're on your own and I'm on my own and fuck you. I, I've never understood that approach. And this is the kind of movie that that makes you think about that. And I love that about this movie. Well, so many of us are even though I mean I'm doing okay, but I mean I'm one travesty away from being <laughs> from being ruined, and I think yeah. most of Middle America is. And yeah, that, I mean that's kind of what happened to her. Her husband died, and all of a sudden, you know that that double income, or whatever they had, disappears all of a sudden. And if you don't have a proper, you know, there's a lot of things that could go wrong that just could financially ruin financially ruin anybody. It sounds kind of like, you know. I'm, I can't think of the third movie, but like Nomad Land meets the Florida Project with maybe something else, uh, right? Yeah, like the movie last week, Looney, like living living your entire life just to work. I mean, that's the really the, the, this is the thing that that we've done in our in our society for years is that we we've engendered this idea that that. Uh, the harder you work, the better life will be. That's not always the case, especially when all you do is work. And that's pretty much all she can do is just constantly work uh, and never get to enjoy, you know, any, any reason, never get a moment to enjoy what comes from that work. Yeah. And how hard you work is also how uh, valuable you are as a human being to many people as well. So I have so much sympathy for this type of uh, story. Sympathy and also like, come on, man, let's help these people, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I'm glad that you're telling it to me so that I don't really have to watch it and experience it for myself. <laughs> there's also a thing like, you know, there's a lot of people too, where, where again, it's part of society and it's part of what we bred into people, the unwillingness to ask for help. Or the or this uh, you know the clinging to things that you don't really need. Uh, she's got a you know she's got her husband's ring and she could hawk that ring and you know make the payment that she needs to make. But she she's you know kind of nostalgic for it. She doesn't want to let it go. 
which I understand, and she shouldn't have to. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't have to give that up. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that 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 again, that notion of like it. We've we've told people don't ask for help or don't be a burden to your friends and family. Uh, that's uh, the word burden right in there is just right in that phrase, you know. And, and that's another thing. Like she's she's grown up that way. She's grown up in the way that you don't ask people to help you. You don't tell people that there's something wrong. That's the title. I'm fine. Thanks for asking. She's lying. She's lying to people because she doesn't want to become a burden to her friends and family. Yeah, I, I'm kind of excited about seeing this one. Actually, both of them. I don't know when that'll be. Usually, uh, whenever these film festivals, you just never know when the release date will be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think it could hang around during awards season? Because, I mean, it does sound like movies we've talked about. But I really hope so. I really hope this movie sticks around for a long time. It did win uh, an audience award at South by Southwest, so hopefully that means good things. All right. The moment everybody's been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> Zack Snyder's Justice League. Sean's going to apologize for four hours. Not, <laughs> not apologizing for anything. <laughs> so mad. So mad at this movie. Uh, I'm mad because I liked it. Okay. There, I said it. I like this movie. Uh, the, the four hour Justice League feels like a really good uh, streaming TV show. Uh, and that's really what. If you go into it, instead of thinking of it as a four-hour movie, you think about it as a four-hour binge of a TV show. It gets a lot easier to watch. And I really enjoyed the way that they did this. And it's, you know, you've you've seen Justice League before. You kind of know the story that Steppenwolf is coming down to steal the mother boxes and put them together and bring about the, the end of the earth or whatever. The point here for me is that th- this movie – what it does differently than I, what I remember of Joss Whedon's version of this that I've kind of put out of my mind completely is that it takes these characters seriously. It removes a lot of the a lot of the dopey humor uh, of the first film, uh, the first version of this, the Whedon version, and and allows these characters a little bit more dignity and self respect. Like especially Aquaman doesn't have a lot of that broy humor that was so irritating about uh, Whedon's version. Uh, some of it's still there, but not not a lot of it. And then the, a lot of the really cringier lines that that didn't feel right coming from these characters are gone from this version, and I appreciated that. I also appreciated that he, in in to use a wrestling terminology, he puts these characters over. He makes you believe that these characters can hang with this big bad from another universe, uh, and instead of you know treating them instead of treating them like underdogs, which is a, another kind of a modern trope, is turning super power, super power characters into the underdogs, like the uh, stacking the odds against them over and over and over again. These characters feel capable uh, of taking this thing on very you know very capably. And I appreciated that the odds are stacked against them, but not nearly as much. And they have, you know, the, the brains and the ability to overcome that. And I was really, I really appreciated that approach. Like you, every fight scene from beginning to end felt like one where they could end this. And I, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, and I, I appreciate it. Also the, the Amazons getting a chance to shine. They, there's a six, a, a series of scenes that he puts back into the movie where the Amazons actually battle Steppenwolf. And instead of getting their asses kicked, they really beat him up. And he's got to like, he, he narrowly escapes with the, uh, with the mother box, this MacGuffin thing. And I appreciated that, that he made them look good instead of making them look foolish, which the first film uh, kind of did that to both Atlantis and, and uh, Amazonia that they, they kind of look dumb <laughs> for, for letting their box go in that version. And here they look like t- they look really tough and, and badass, and like he just narrowly escaped. And so that's, that, all that stuff added up to being, making this movie very exciting and, and involving. And uh, I, I appreciate what, what Snyder did here. I, even at four hours, it's, like I said, it feels like a good four-hour binge TV show. Josh? Well, I, uh, I have been waiting for... Um, a good Justice League movie since I was four years old and was watching the Super Friends. And uh, that kind of thing was fascinating to me. And I had also at that point seen the 1978 Superman movie. That was the, th- I cared about that the most. Superman, Batman, it it rivaled Star Wars. So this kind of project is literally like a, it's a dream. And so the 2017 one 
all of the the news and the unfortunate parts of that that surrounded it were just so disappointing. You know, uh, we talked about it on the show. It just it was obviously rushed and obviously mishandled by a studio and they had their hands all over it. And I don't know exactly what Joss Whedon was going for, because look, watching this movie, it's a completely different movie. And I actually liked this movie. Not only did I like it, I'm bordering on saying that I loved it. Uh, the four hour part to me, I don't care. Uh, maybe if anything, the the third portion of the story gets a little bogged down in preparation for the final fight. Um, there's a lot of going back and forth between the characters to set them up so that they're all in position for that fourth quarter of the story. Um, but what Sean said about Zack Snyder taking this material seriously and the actors being behind that, you could see that that was there the entire time as the base. And instead, somebody messed with it and tried to make it more fun because everybody wanted to have the Marvel snarkiness, the Guardians of the Galaxy jokes. Um, that works for Marvel. These characters, I think, are meant to be taken seriously and, and feel more heroic. There's something behind uh, DC about these towering images where the comic likes to shoot uh, almost from underneath the character as if it's a film to make the characters seem taller, to make them seem more imposing and godlike. And this movie recognizes that. There are a ton of shots like that, a ton of scenes that allow them to prove their actual heroism and their badassness. This movie takes action for DC characters and really amps it up. Uh, there are some scenes where people get thrown around and they basically explode in a way behind them. There's there's real blood and violence in this one that I didn't expect. Um, the scene where Wonder Woman is introduced and, and she takes care of terrorists at a museum of all places, that has been altered to make her be more badass. <laughs> and uh, the, the Batman scenes, uh, which he's actually kicking ass, that seemed harder to me. Uh, I'm very, very pleased with how serious Zack Snyder took this. He, like uh, his other films before, Batman versus Superman specifically, but also, I'll say Watchmen, uh, he swings for the fences here. And you guys know how much I love to use that phrase because it, it encapsulates every time a director clearly goes for broke and isn't interested in pleasing anyone else but honoring his original story, ah, uh, be it fan service or not, I still think that it's it's his vision specifically and whatever he wanted to do originally and what he ended up with, it's just great. Um, I love it. I cherish it. I realize it's no Oscar contending film here, but it is very special to me. And how they ended it <laughs> um, might be the only misstep. Uh, Sean, I think you know what I'm talking about with that nightmare scene towards yeah. the end. Um, it's not that it's shitty. It's just that it's disjointed. The film had already basically ended, and then we've got to do some service to Jared Leto for some reason. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. I, I, I guess here's where my take on that, though, is this isn't as much a movie as it is just kind of a director's cut. So there's this isn't the movie he would have released if Joss Whedon never came on no, board. No, probably not, no. So you're probably looking at an hour and a half out of this movie, a tighter movie, and it kind of pisses me off because that probably would have been a fantastic movie. Uh, there's a lot of fat on here, but I didn't care because it was, it was kind of like that Lord of the Rings theory I have where people just like being in that world, so they don't care that it's nine hours long. It's the same thing here. The whole Flash scene at the beginning, they could have sped the fuck out of that thing. It, it was totally pointless other than showing what he does. But they yeah. took their time with it, and it, and it, but it was entertaining and it was good. And even the Wonder Woman scene at the beginning, it's long, and it's all these scenes are. It, it took its time. It spent its time developing the characters, allowing them to you know <clears throat> to all matter equally, not just the big three. And uh, I appreciated that about it. And but again, this isn't really a movie as much as it's just an experience, I guess. 
Uh, but it kind of pisses me off because it would have been like it would have been nice to know what could have happened with this. I feel like he, you know, he wanted to eventually get to some sort of Batman Joker showdown. Never got to do that in a future movie, so why not throw it on here real quick? And I thought it was cool. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. I agree, but I enjoyed it. You know, it's. Uh, I don't know. I don't even like movies that look like this generally. It's like there's so much CGI, but for whatever reason, it I, it was just good. My wife, we started watching the first hour of it, and, she, and I didn't anticipate her sticking around. But we had to turn it off after an hour because we had to go do something, and she would not let me watch it until she was able to watch it with me, you know, finish the last three hours, which was like two days later. Uh, so that's how much she ended up enjoying it. Uh I don't know. I just I, I like the way he did everything. You know, they you talk about the Aquaman, the Dubro stuff. There's enough of it in there now where he comes off more of, of a badass than just kind of a dick jock. Uh, you know, all the characters mattered equally. Batman was more realistic. He's the least powerful of all of these guys, <laughs> and he's off in the side shooting a gun in the corner while everybody else is having the real fight. I, I mean, it was really just really taken very seriously and that's what i uh, appreciate I, I like this kind of stuff more than the marvel stuff the marvel stuff's more entertaining i'm sure it, it's fun to watch but I, I like the seriousness that they try to do with this but you know what is interesting about the seriousness though is that is that it's still fun like as, as they, it, he and that's the thing like that was missing from like for me for watchmen or for 300 uh there's he, there doesn't appear to be any fun being had it's it becomes dour at a certain point and this is not that this is uh this is taking this seriously but the but it's underlying how excited it's underlined by how exciting everything is and it's exciting to watch these characters fight and they aren't they aren't necessarily taking themselves so seriously they're just being themselves and it happens to be a very serious situation and i i think that's a it's a it's a hairline difference but it's an important one uh and when you talk about batman uh batman is allowed here to be uh he may not be obviously he's not powerful and he can't be in the middle of some of those fights but he is smart and they they give him opportunities to plan everything and and to show off just how smart he is uh, so, yes, he's not a superpowered being, but he's brilliant in his own way. And he brings that to this aspect and uh, lets the superhero, you know, the, the superpower beings really do their thing. And he facilitates that. And they, they do that for all of these characters. They give them all uh, something like that. And I really loved that. I really loved what Ray Fisher does here with Cyborg. He gives him a very he gives him a really good energy, a really a dark, a darkness that was missing from the first movie. Like we did. I didn't realize just how much we needed Joe Morton. Joe Morton, like without Joe Morton in that first movie, Cyborg is just kind of spinning his wheels the entire time. And here there's a whole big emotional through line that is there now. I really appreciate it. I think it's very interesting that Joe Morton got to play Miles Dyson a second time after Terminator 2 because basically his role is very, very similar <laughs> to the Miles Dyson character. He's, he's created a cyborg in a way, <laughs> and he has to go about making amends for the thing that he's done. So what Prussian casting? <laughs> Yeah, and back to the just the fact that it takes its time. I, I think that does make it better. You know, Aquaman could have joined right away. You know, and they needed all it, just to make it more realistic. And then I, I enjoy the fun. I didn't need the fun. I'm all for the darkness and the dour and all that. <laughs> but the fun does add something here. It just makes me frustrated what could have been with the future of the series because, quite frankly, it looks like the Marvel stuff's falling apart now. <laughs> and uh, This could have been really good. Just kind of bummed. To be fair, I mean, if we're going to go ahead and say that the Snyderverse is over, which for all intents and purposes it is, um, as it has gone up and down, it has at least carved itself its own little area of this genre that I can say, okay, there's like five, six films in the Snyderverse, um, Wonder Woman kind of being a part of that, but not really, uh, where we can say this is an arc. It's over now. They're going to do things by themselves first, but it's not completely devoid of joy. It's not a total failure. There's a lot of things that I can at least 
and joy out of that. And, and we've had some good things to say about it. We've rightfully put down something like Suicide Squad or or the the uh, like the sheen of Man of Steel. <laughs> uh, they've changed coloring on that a couple of times because of the way that it was looking on screen. So, yes, they messed it up. Uh, and they did things too soon, uh, but it's not a total loss. And I can I can get into that. Imagine if you're, for example, a Fantastic Four fan, and you've got three films out there right now, and they all suck. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's your four thing. of them. Actually, there's actually four that. that suck them. <laughs> Is there? Oh Jesus, you're right. <laughs> that's the Roger Corman one, <laughs> right? That'd be the best one of all of them. Right, be the best one of all of them. <laughs> And every time I look at uh, the logo for the most recent one, I remember Sean saying fan four stick. So that, you know, that, that's my lasting memory. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we weren't, when Mana still came out, I, I remember our episode was fairly positive on that movie. Uh, obviously the Batman versus Superman. We, we, that was one of our biggest episodes ever. I didn't hate suicide squad. I know you guys did, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I just wish they had a, way to tighten this up and do it again or just recut everything and <laughs> do what he did here and then just put them all out together uh but i mean the, with affleck being out for the most part i don't know it seems like it's pretty well over yeah. then again we, we can consider the fact that ben affleck is going to play batman it one more time um yeah. he's in the flash movie right along with michael keaton so in a way we can maybe get a, a small peering you know maybe even with a little um handheld lens into the snyderverse one more time and see affleck tell the joker that he is going to fucking kill him one more time <laughs> which by the way i almost stood up and yelled che- i cheered at in my head see that's why you needed that scene <laughs> it doesn't mean anything <laughs> but it was cool <laughs> yeah yeah it, see it was disjointed but maybe right. worth it. <clears throat> anything else on justice league before we move on if you don't mind one small thing additionally um the the internet campaign to get this made is one of the things that i found the most fascinating part about this there's been a lot of parts of it and and, uh, a lot of negatives and positives that seem to have come about but going forward if somebody does not like what has been presented to them as a fan base, but they know that there's been meddling and they know that there's something that can be done to change it. Do you think that we should expect more of this? Like the fans actually speaking up and letting this happen. I mean, there's even talk about David Ayer being able to go back and change suicide squad to his version. That's never going to happen. I think, but uh, (laughs) release the air cut. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, people asking J.J. Abrams to release the Rise of Skywalker three-plus-hour cut, which, honestly, I would be all for. Uh, Chris I, Columbus I know and there's the like Mrs. Nobody Doubtfire else cut. in this group that wants it, but I'm <laughs> curious to know what you guys think, if that's something that sh- could or should oh, happen. Don't forget no, Chris no, Columbus's no. Mrs. Doubtfire, the rated R version. <laughs> the the, the, the X rated NC-17 version. version. He did say there isn't an NC-17, it's just R, but... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I... Well, I, I can f- imagine being on a set with Robin Williams, though. Yeah. <laughs> I think this... Part of the reason this happened is due to the pandemic, I believe. Uh, yeah, helped that's definitely. push it around because there was nothing else to do. And once movies go back in full force, uh, studios aren't going to want to spend money going backwards. I don't know how much this helps HBO Max. Uh, quite frankly, I've kind of enjoyed it more than the other platforms. I know they're kind of sticking into the theaters, and that could bite them in the long run, but. I've enjoyed their shows. I've enjoyed their movies. Not all of them. I mean, that Denzel Washington, Jared Leto one sucked ass. Oof. But Yeah, that was bullshit. Uh, but, uh, I mean, that Woody Allen documentary was pretty terrifying and heartbreaking and well done. Uh, I don't know. I, I I would like to see... I get, I'd really like to see studios just staying out of it. You know, thinking what this could have been is what's frustrating. Uh what was so bad about the other one is just how packaged it was. Mm. And uh, hopefully this, if nothing else gets studios to back off a little bit, but I doubt it does. Yeah. 
Uh, I will say one, one last thing for me. I, I kind of choked up a little bit at the dedication to his daughter, what that meant, you know, to him and what that, you know, the reason, I mean, that's the whole reason why this happened the way it did was because his daughter died. And when that popped up at the end, I, I choked up a little bit. I felt for him. Same here, man. Yeah. Nobody in the room understood what I was doing, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else before we move on? All right, let's move on then. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event for the linear, legitimate, and universally recognized, undisputed classic. Hollywood Land. Hollywood Land is uh, the story of the death of the first Superman, uh, George Reeves. Uh, he... Uh, ended up taking his own life in his home, or did he? <laughs> I guess that's the question that the movie is kind of asking, is that there were some elements to this that uh, would lead people to believe that maybe he was murdered. Uh, the idea, the, the story goes that Reeves uh, was dating a Hollywood uh, executive's wife, uh, played by Diane Lane. Uh, Bob Hoskins is the real life, or is, the, is the executive who, real life, Eddie Mannix is a real life guy. Uh, kind of a dangerous figure in in, in Hollywood history and uh, had some mob ties here and there. And uh, Adrian Brody plays a character who is a, is an investigator who essentially gets himself hired by uh, George Reeves' mom to look into the death of George Reeves. And he continues to find a few things here and there that do kind of indicate that maybe something happened here. Um, Brody is truly, for me, the weakest part of this movie as much as I enjoy it. Uh, the uh, I like the I like what Affleck is doing as George Reeves. He's really good at it. He really embodies uh, the the trouble the troubled mind of uh, George Reeves very well. And 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 the uh, the relationship between him and Diane Lane is really interesting. You know, and there's a great scene in this movie where they are going back and forth and hitting each other hard verbally, just just really tearing into each other and in a way that only intimate people can, like when you know somebody's most in, insecure elements, uh, you have a, have the ability to hurt them more than any other people. And the way they hurt each other in that scene is powerful. It really is something that is merely the best, by far the best scene in the movie. Uh, Bob Hoskins is great as well. He's just, he, he, can, he, he communicates being intimidating with very few words. And that's really awesome. It's just Brody just feels like the wrong energy for this. Uh, he's just he's he's not snarky, but he just doesn't have the weight that I want this character to have. I didn't feel the tragedy nearly as much through him because he just doesn't feel serious enough. Um, and that's really unfortunate. I just don't know quite. I don't know. It's just something about Brody's energy really holds me back on loving this movie as much as I want to. I can't tell if it's him or the character. You know, yeah. if you throw Matt Damon in there, does it get better? I mean, I don't, you know, or Brad Pitt or what? I, I don't know, because uh, it's, and I, I mean, I like the movie. It's just I don't love it because it's, it's interesting, but then it's just kind of there. I mean, I think Affleck. Part of why Affleck's so good is like this happened like right at the tip of his popularity, right on the down, the downside of his popularity. And right. he, he could really relate to this character, I'm sure. <laughs> it was weird to see Batman sleeping with Superman's mom <laughs> and wearing the Superman clothes. It's just odd. <laughs> I was hoping that somebody would bring that up. I'm like, man, that's really going to piss Superman off in the future when Affleck and Bruce Wayne is sleeping with, with Martha. <laughs> and wearing his clothes and costumes. <laughs> Dressing as his son to screw his mom. Jesus. <laughs> Literally watch this after watching Justice League. So it's hard to separate the two. But, uh, I mean, it's just kind of a... I, I, I think you're right. I, I think it's the the weight is in the side parts of the movie and not the main story, which just makes it different. I don't quite love it because of that in... I don't really. I, get, I don't know. I got tired of Brody's energy. That's everything. Every room he walks into, he's just doing this. And, you know, he's doing. He's doing a, like, hey, hey, man, hey. I don't know about the reporters. You know, hey guys, come on, man. Why don't you report the truth about George Reeves, man? I'd almost rather you cut him out of it and reach, just told the George Reeves story three right. different times. You know, you showed the different. I think that might have been more interesting and probably a tighter movie. Maybe uh, yeah. using him to 
tell the three store or three possibilities, but I don't know. It's fine. It's I guess I'd call it good, but <laughs> it could be. It could have been a really, really great movie and a really good story there. Yeah. All right. 1991 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 The Secret of the Ooze Come on Sean tell me you liked it Please tell me you liked it uh, I didn't hate it Okay good that's all I needed out of you I, I didn't hate it Okay because I went into this With a you know again a, kind of a bad Attitude because I've got the because you know, I remember That whole cringy vanilla Ice go ninja go Ninja go shit and I really Had it just you really was just dreading That and what I came out of this with was that that scene isn't that bad <laughs> because the turtles are still really fun. And this and I think the biggest issue that I have with this one is the changes of the voices from the first movie. That really that kind of bothered me. I missed the couple well, at least Corey Feldman. I wanted Corey Feldman back. <laughs> <laughs> the voices on this one because I thought his voice was better. Uh, the voices in this one kind of threw me off. I'm just trying to remember who was who because the first one, it felt distinct. You know, you, the, each character had their own distinct sort of voice and here it's like one of them was like really broadly New York and it really just drove me nuts. Right. Uh, but other than that, this isn't that bad. Uh, it's the turtles finding their origin via this uh, kind of convoluted a story about uh, is it an evil company or a not evil company that's trying to hide uh, their ooze that they buried in the something anyway i don't care it, the, the, it, this is a fun movie that little kids absolutely adored and i get why they adored it because it's a lot of fun it's not nearly as good as the first movie josh right. i actually put tmnt in my top 10 of 1990 uh, after seeing that one <laughs> i heard i remember that episode. <laughs> Well, I, bl- I might have even been on that episode talking about the top <laughs> of, of that year. And it definitely pleased me to hear that. Hey, you know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 is um, it came at a time like not only TMNT came like one year prior to that. So they just shot this right out. It, it's like diarrhea cinema. OK, it's all just coming after the other. Uh, but I see it as like uh, the apex of the neon movement. You know, it's like in 1991, the the hyper color had kind of come and gone at that point. Uh, it's like the death of the 80s with this movie, because it almost seemed I remember this watching in the theater that this kind of was like, eh, it's on the edge of cool now. Like this was cool a few months ago and in, in 1989 and stuff. And it just kind of reached that point where I was like, eh. And it also reached that point where I was kind of done with action figures for a while. Whereas the first movie, I couldn't wait to get to the store to get all of those turtles. Right. I mean, I pretty much just had to. But in this one, there wasn't nearly the uh, the outrolling of toys. After all, they couldn't even get them out in time. Uh, and then on top of that, there wasn't like a super shredder available to buy. There wasn't a Toka and Razor to buy. So as a kid, I kind of saw this as, yeah, the movie's cool, but it's the end of something. Uh, but I still enjoyed it. The ooze is cool looking, you know, uh, vanilla ice was a big thing. So even though the song sucked, it was like, look, the new cool guy that dresses weird and has weird hair that I can never have. Cause my parents won't let me. Yay. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was that for at least our age, it was that summer of uh, like, what was it between fifth and sixth grade or right around that time. I think six, I think I was, I don't remember, but regardless, it You're was correct. like, you go from this, and then later on in the year, Terminator 2 comes out, and we all start to get into more adult movies with that. It seemed like this year is where we start to leave the stuff behind. But at the same time, I do remember liking this. And and then watching it again, it's just like, they don't do anything. They spray the guys with fire extinguishers, and then Shredder knocks a bridge down. <laughs> like They don't even beat anybody. <laughs> they just beat themselves. Uh, but it was I thought it was fun enough for yeah. what it was. I, I, at least I didn't hate it. That's the key is that I did not hate this. Well, I knew it couldn't be what the first one was, but as long as you could just kind of carry enough of it over, that's what I was hoping for. So I'm good with that. <laughs> we don't have to fight over it. <laughs> Defending your life. 
<laughs> Defending Your Life is uh, directed and written by uh, Albert Brooks and starring Albert Brooks and Meryl Streep and the story of a man who uh, dies in a car accident and ends up in Judgment City where you have to defend what your life. And this is a version of the afterlife that uh, really influenced the rest of my life after seeing this. Like I wanted this, like this was the first time where I thought I, I really got into atheism or, or at least getting away from Christianity. That's for sure. And abandoning that whole aspect of life uh, because of this movie. Cause it made me think about, well, why couldn't there be a different version? And there, then I started looking in and there are different versions of what the afterlife might be. And I really loved that this movie did that for me. Uh, but it's also just really super charming. Uh, so the the idea here is that Albert Brooks has to go and essentially have his life put on trial. And uh, Rip Torn plays his uh, defender, and he's got a prosecutor who's you know calling out his life. And if he's if if that prosecutor can prove that he's still uh, he didn't overcome his fears, he can't move on and become part of the universe. And uh, meanwhile, Meryl Streep is there, and they begin to fall in love. And She's got this great life where it's very clear that she's moving on to the next life. And uh, he's got to figure out, you know, he's got to defend himself and, uh, you know, try and deal with this relationship that he's having that he might not get to have any further beyond this. This movie is just, again, super charming. And and this is the first time I, I got to see a Meryl Streep movie uh, that didn't feel like homework. I went into it like I was always going into this movie in 91 you know, just always Meryl Streep was just like the homework actress to me, especially like out of out of Africa, just felt like years and years and years long. <laughs> just the worst, the worst test to sit through. And then you had every, a lot of the stuff before that, just my, my perception. I'm not saying that they are. I'm just saying my perception right. in 1991 as a you know 15 year old. That was my perception of it. it was just everything she did was homework. And then this she like creates here a character that like became my model of what I wanted out of a woman the rest of my life. Like the, this character is just so beautiful and sweet and charming. And it, it created a sort of a template for me for, for the kind of woman that I've been fall in love with in the future. Like that's what this movie means to me. So there you go. I just want to see the poster <laughs> where it's defending your life. And then the quote, this movie made me want to be an atheist. Sean Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, pardon me for stepping in here. I'm just going to really quick inject. I've seen this movie definitely over a dozen times in my teen years. It was a favorite of my mother's. And although Albert Brooks has been great in some things, I think that he's a bit of an acquired taste. Um, his neuroses or whatever is, is on a, a similar level, not to belabor a Woody Allen point, but Woody Allen. And he's got that same kind of, nervous energy about him just on a, a bit more relatable scale and uh it didn't rub me the right way with this movie i i always saw it as mom's might making me watch another adult contemporary type of film and there's nothing wrong with that per se i just don't necessarily care for it and on top of like i guess if there's anything to really enjoy here it's when he first gets to heaven and there's the oh yeah there's you don't have a body you can eat whatever you want and i always think of that whenever i'm really hungry i wish i was in heaven so i could just eat the shit out of waffles okay so never watch this movie on a diet it will piss you off <laughs> sorry i have a bunch of satanic things in my head uh <laughs> I'm always telling my nieces and nephews that hell's better than heaven because all the fun people <laughs> go there. <laughs> and when Sean said this made him want to be an atheist, there's this documentary. I think we talked about the trailer when it came out. It's called Hail Satan? Question mark. Yeah. And it is so good. It's on Hulu right now. I just watched it about a week ago. And if you just think about kind of this last year and the whole pandemic and everybody throwing the Constitution around, this is like the ultimate troll movie. <laughs> Just atheists <laughs> who play Dungeons and Dragons pretending to be. I mean, I guess they are Satanists, I suppose. But it's so good and so entertaining. A little over long, but I highly recommend watching it. It'll, it'll almost make you want to join them. <laughs> Just to, just to, for a quick point, just the, this is the movie that made me question whether there was a heaven because there are various different. <laughs> it was the first time I realized really fully that there were different versions of the way that people saw the afterlife. And if there are different versions, then maybe just it's all fucking made up. That's really where I came down on it. 
I love putting words in his mouth, though. <laughs> <laughs> Making him clarify later on. <laughs> uh, also, uh, Sharon's some movie called Scissors came out. I don't know if you've ever seen that. No, you, never heard of it. <laughs> you seen it, Josh? Go on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And then Mr. Johnson with Pierce Brosnan. This looks terrible. I mean, everybody's wanting to see this movie. This is the Justice League of its year. Um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that is our show. Uh, next week, we've got Bad Trip in, on Netflix, along with Six Minutes to Midnight. Uh also on Netflix, a movie called Four Weeks Away, or A Week Away, Secret Magic Control Agency, our classic is Hardcore, and in 1991, Career Opportunities, The Comfort of Strangers, and Five Heartbeats, and Hardcore is a Paul Schrader movie, and he also did The Comfort of Strangers, uh, so we'll be probably watching both of those. Uh, do we have time for Flick Chart, everybody? I do. I do. All right, then let me see if I can find it. <laughs> All right, Vanilla Sky or A Knight's Tale? Vanilla Sky. A Knight's Tale. <laughs> Josh, are you there? Oh, I'm here. I'm so sorry about that. I'll take Vanilla Sky. Sideways or Dick Tracy? Sideways. Sideways. Agreed. U.S. Marshals, Burn After Reading. Burn After Reading. U.S. Marshals. <laughs> burn After Reading. La La Land, Far Cry. I don't think anybody's seen Far Cry. The Far Cry is a video game, man. <laughs> La La well, Land. Okay. Or, it could be. A <laughs> La La Land, Bend It Like Beckham. La La Land. Same. Agreed. Back to the Future, A View to Kill. Back to the Future. Same. <laughs> Wonder Woman Bloodlines. That's, That's a cartoon. A cartoon. <clears throat> Psycho Boys in the Hood. Jesus. Psycho. <laughs> uh, oh, I thought for a second you said boys on the side, and I thought it was going to be a very easy. No, uh, <laughs> Psycho it is. I agree. The Revenant, Cool Hand Luke. The Revenant. I'll take Cool Hand Luke. Man, that's hard. I think I'm going to go Cool Hand Luke, too. God, I don't know. That's tough. The Santa Claus 2, <laughs> Casablanca. Casablanca. Damn. I agree. The Great Gatsby, you, me, and Dupree. The Great Gatsby. I guess. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't give a shit. Stranger Than Fiction, Robocop 2. Stranger Than Fiction. <laughs> Same. So I Married an Ex-Murderer, Sin City. Sin City. Sin City. Baby Driver, Toy Story. Toy Story. Toy Story. Agreed. Witness, Inner Space, 1987. Witness. Witness. Flight Plan, (laughs) Aragon. (laughs) Flight Plan. I never saw Aragon, but I'm sure it's full I planned. <laughs> <laughs> the Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, Wally. 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 Teenage Mutant Ninja <laughs> Turtles 3 or The Jerk? The Jerk. The Jerk. Agreed. Cinderella Man or not a comedy special. Cinderella Man, Three Men and a Baby. Cinderella Man. I guess. <laughs> I agree. Chud or from hell? <laughs> from hell. <laughs> from hell. Sorry, Jason from New Mexico. <laughs> Tango and Cash, Secret Window. Secret Window. I'm going with Tango and Cash only because that was an incredibly fun, awful movie. See, I didn't think it was as fun as it was. But Kurt Russell well, it was my first 70. time. <laughs> You know how the fun the yeah. first time. <laughs> I go uh, secret window. Fun with Dick and Jane or the guest. I don't remember the guest. I don't either. Fun with Dick and Jane or Michael Clayton. Michael Clayton. Same. Underworld. Let the right one in. Let the right one in. Agreed. 
Yes. Rear window drive. Rear window. Same. I'll go drive just for fun because that's a good movie. Uh, 12 Angry Men, 28 Days Later. 12 Angry Men. I'll agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> Conan the Destroyer, Battle Royale. Battle Royale. Battle Royale. Agreed. Black Panther, A Beautiful Mind. Black Panther. Black Panther. Go oh, Beautiful Mind. Private Benjamin, Requiem for a Dream. Requiem for a Dream. Same, although I'll never watch it again. <laughs> Wall Street, Poltergeist. Uh, come on, son. Come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, all right, all right, all right. Give it to Josh. <laughs> yes. Uh, Terminator Salvation, Iron Man. Iron Man. Iron Man. Agreed. Empire Records, Cold Mountain. <sighs> That's hard for me. That is, honestly, I know they're very different movies. It's actually kind of hard for me. But I'm going to go Cold Mountain just because the extended cut of Empire Records is so bad. <laughs> I, I've not seen the extended cut, but uh, Empire Records is so much less Oscar positioning for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, no offense, Cold Mountain, but it's Empire Records. Yeah, I would go Empire Records as well. The extended cut of Cold Mountain is unbearable. Uh, <laughs> Moonraker, Quantum of Salus. Uh, Moonraker. Pick your poison. I'll take exactly. Quantum of Salus. <laughs> Let's go with Josh. Uh, Wedding Crashers, Blade Trinity. Wedding Crashers. I'll even have to say Wedding Crashers. I agree. A Quiet Place, The Thing. That's a good one. That is a good one. Um, Pretty easy for me. Are we talking about the 1982 thing or the similarly named 2011 prequel? The 82. Okay. Um, I'm going to go Quiet Place. Go I will go The Thing. thing. <laughs> Quiet Place had too many flaws. I did like it, though. Cube or The Last King of Scotland? Last King of Scotland. I mean, no, I'm not Same. a big fan. A Scanner Darkly, The Brothers Grimm. Both deeply flawed movies. Uh, both not really very good movies, honestly. Scanner Darkly. I'll go with Brothers Grimm. They're both, as Sean said, very flawed. I'll flip a coin because I don't give a shit. <laughs> and Brothers Grimm wins. Swingers flight plan. Swingers flight plan. All about swingers. <laughs> All right, last one. Aliens, <laughs> good fellas. Good fellas. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you want it, Dan. <laughs> Absolutely, of course. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us, Josh. This is fun. <laughs> thanks, yeah, Josh. thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. It was really nice to be able to talk about uh, the Snyder Cut with people that would actually give a shit. So <laughs> much appreciation, guys. All right. Talk to you later. All Take right. care. Good Bye. day.